And if you have your Bibles, we please turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter three. If you're wondering where Ecclesiastes is, it's right in the middle of your Bible, Ecclesiastes chapter three. That's where we'll be starting today. Hey, by the way, if you're here and you're new, not just to Thrive, but you're new to church generally, maybe maybe you went to church a long, long, long time ago, but you know it's been a while since you've been at any church. Maybe you've never been to church before. Maybe you're coming in from a different faith background. You're just kind of curious. We love the fact that you're here, and we hope that you find that Thrive is a safe safe place for you, a place where you can find some hope and some encouragement to help you start this week. And if we can have, uh, it'll be of any help to you at all, you can always email us at info at thrivechurch.ca. We'd love to hear from you. We're doing a series here at Thrive. It's called New Hearts, New Horizons. And it's because we absolutely believe that both for each and every one of you personally, and for us as a church family, God has new horizons for us. If you believe that, say Amen. And see, we believe that God is a God of new horizons, that he's always leading us to new things because he's a God who doesn't stay in one place, but he's a God who moves and we want to be people who move with him. And I am very, very blessed and honored and privileged today to bring you the final uh, message of this series called New Heart, New Horizons. This also happens to be the theme of our year here at Thrive Church for 2021, 2022. And so you know, we're gonna keep on coming back to this idea of new heart, new horizons. But for today, today's the final episode of the series called New Heart, New Horizons, and I'm so looking forward to giving this message to you guys. Are you ready today? Here, let's get into it right now. The message I'm here to share with you is called, Is It Time? Is It Time? Understanding when God is leading you to a new horizon. See, we believe that God leads us to new horizons. And, you know, let me just share with you one story that I will never forget. You know, a long, long time ago, when my wife and I uh, first got married, uh, Char gave me, my wife Charlene, she gave me a beautiful watch as a gift. And, you know, for some reason, every time I wore that watch, for some reason, time would just stop. Um, and that's not just because when I'm with Charlene, time just seems to stand still. It's not just because of that, but it's also because there's a real problem with this watch. Like, the, 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 I, I went to the store, the, the battery is, is fine, we don't know what's wrong with it, but you know, the battery's fine. And, and the reason I found out that there was a problem with this watch is I found out the hard way. On the first day that I wore this watch, I was scheduled to meet someone at 3 p.m. And I looked at my watch to get ready to meet. Oh no, it's 2 p.m. Okay, I got, about a, I got in one hour, I've still got time. And just a few minutes later, I get a call from the guy saying, uh, aren't we meeting at 3 p.m.? I'm like, yeah, 3 p.m. He's like, it's 4 p.m. right now. I'm like, are you serious? It's 4 p.m. I looked at my watch, it still said 2 p.m. And like, what happened was that my watch sometime, sometime during the day had stopped and I had no idea. I felt so bad for being an hour late to that meeting. It was the first and only time I ever sent flowers to another guy. And it was one of those things where I'm like, you know, I've never worn that watch ever since, although I still keep it with me because it's a gift. But here's the thing. Why do I mention that story with you today? It's because problems can happen when we don't know what time it is. And see, today in this final episode of our New Heart, New Horizons series, the message I'm here to share with you is called, Is It Time? Understanding when God is leading you to a new horizon. Would you turn your ear and say, is it time? Is it time? See, today we're looking at how do you know when is it time for a new horizon? Maybe it's when it comes to changing jobs or you know, you know, changing uh, something about your life. How do you know when God is leading you to a new horizon? How do you know when God is leading you to make a decision that's gonna impact your future in a major way? See, to start, I wanted to begin with Ecclesiastes 3, which is known in many circles as possibly one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible. It's one, certainly one of the most famous. In fact, back in the 1960s, there was a group called The Birds who made this one song famous that was all based on this passage, practically word for word. If you're curious what that song is, just Google the birds, B-Y-R-D-S, uh, and they do a song called Turn, 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 which is based on this passage we're going to read right now. But let's look at this passage right now. Ecclesiastes 3, starting with verse 1. I'm going to stop you at certain points to kind of unpack some stuff, but let's get into it right now. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 says this. Read it with me right now in a big loud voice. It says, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. Stop right there. What does that mean? See, a time to scatter stones, a time to gather them. What does that mean? See, you ought to know this. Back in ancient times, 
when an army would conquer a town. The soldiers, as a sign of victory, they would throw stones on the fields where that other country had been farming. In a way, just to kind of level the field and kind of say, we won. And that, that happens, for example, in 2 Kings chapter 3. And so that's kind of the idea of you, 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 you scatter stones as a sign of victory. In contrast, when you're gathering stones on a field, what is that? That's kind of like starting fresh again. That's like, you know, you're picking up the pieces of your life. Maybe you've gone through some kind of fall, some kind of defeat, and you're ready to sow seeds again. And so a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them could very well mean a time to, there's a time to win, there's a time to lose. There's a time for victory, there's a time for defeat. There's, you know, you win some, you lose some. That could very well be what verse five is talking about. Let's continue to read verse five. It says, a time to embrace and a time to refrain. Verse six, a time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. Have you ever been in this situation before? You're clearing your house and uh, maybe there's one of you who really wants to keep stuff. They're all oh, such sentimental value. All oh, this means so much. And the other, we haven't seen that in years. Just throw it away. You know, we don't, you don't need that. You're not, you use that. You know, probably in every home, there's one person who wants to keep and one person who wants to throw. Uh, here's verse seven. It says, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak. Verse eight, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Maybe you're here and you're wondering this. Is, is there ever really a time to hate. See, as followers of Jesus, we are called to love everybody. That's our calling. As followers of Jesus, we love everyone, regardless of who they are, regardless of their background, regardless of what they're We love every single person because that's God's unconditional love for us. If you believe that, say amen. amen. And so that's why I'm here to remind you is that here at Thrive, regardless of your background, you are loved by God and we love you as well. And in case you're wondering when you see people on the stage, see, we're, we're not just a, a, you know, an Asian church that happens to have a lot of other people from different nationalities and cultures and ethnicities and colors worshiping with us. No, we happen to be, you know, we are a, a multicolored, multi-ethnic, multicultural church that happens to have a lot of Asians because hey, Vancouver has a lot of Asians, amen. <laughs> But we love everyone because we're a multicolored, multi-ethnic, multicultural church because that's also the kingdom of God. And see, does hate ever have a place? Well, not toward people, not toward individuals, but you can hate sin, just like God hates sin. You can hate injustice, you can hate evil, you can hate racism, and you can hate the effects that these things have in our world, but there, is there a time to hate? Well, only in those ways, not when it comes to people, but there's a time to love and a time to hate. What is the purpose of, of, of chapter three of Ecclesiastes? It's saying that there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. Now, some scholars will tell you that you know, Ecclesiastes three is a statement of what it means to be human, is that, you you know, we are human beings. We're not God. We're not eternals like the film right now. We are mortal and we are limited by time. Others will say, you know, Ecclesiastes 3 is, is really talking about the cycle of life. How, you know, there's a time to be born, a time to die. Life is full of joys and sorrows. There's highs, there's lows. Both are fine ways to look at this passage. But I believe there's another layer to this passage that you need to keep in mind. See, here at Thrive, we're all about applying scripture to our lives and asking, okay, how does this scripture passage affect me? How does it, what does it mean? mean for me today. And I especially find this is that when you're dealing with a big decision you have to make, when you have to make a decision about your future that's going to affect you and affect others, when you're dealing with even just a difficult situation, this passage can be especially meaningful because it outlines some of the options that you're going to be considering. For example, when you're in a conflict with someone or you're dealing with an especially sensitive topic, an especially sensitive issue, then the end of verse seven becomes relevant. There's a time to be silent and there's a time to speak. It's like, should I say something or should I actually, you know, just be quiet right now? Should I remain silent or should I speak? out. You know, that's often the options we're thinking about when we're dealing with a difficult situation. Another one is this, when you're a parent, you're trying to discipline a naughty child. You know, at the beginning of verse seven can be relevant as well. There's a time to tear and a time to mend. It's like, you know, I'm going to discipline this child, but then at the end, I'm also going to bring them back again and say, I love you. You know that, you know, daddy loves you so much. It's about, there's a time to tear. There's a time to mend. Say you're in a strained relationship right now, or maybe work is just really, really tough. And you think to yourself, how much longer can I go on with this? Do I still want to go on? Should I I still go on. Should I break this up or should I build this up again? Verse three becomes meaningful to you. There's a time to kill and a time to heal. 
There's a time to tear down and a time to build. Say you're needing to say goodbye to something or even someone that means very much to you. Maybe you're trying to move on with life. Then verse two becomes meaningful for you. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. Maybe you're considering whether or not to enter into a relationship. They're like, oh, you know, should I say yes? Should I wait? You know, there's verse, verse five, a time to embrace and a time to refrain. Finally, say you're trying to figure out an answer to a really difficult problem. Then verse six could be something for you. There's a time to search and a time to give up. Do I keep on researching? Do I keep on analyzing this? Do I keep on trying to figure this out? Or do I just give up and surrender this and say, maybe I'll never know? See, these are all different options that we consider when we're trying to make a decision. And see, Ecclesiastes 3 describes some of the biggest choices we will ever have to make in life. Do I kill this or do I heal this? Do I speak up? Do I stay silent? Do I, you know, which way should I go? And here's the thing. Ecclesiastes 3 says there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. But how many know this? There's a time for everything, but it takes wisdom to know what this present time is for. You see, if you want to be wise, it's about knowing what the time you're in right now is for. See, let me put it to you this way. Wise people can tell time better than foolish people. And what, I don't mean that oh, wise people know how to read their watch better than foolish people. I don't mean that. What I mean is that wise people have a better understanding than foolish people as to what this present moment is for, what this season that they're in is for. For foolish people, it's like anything goes, any time is right. But for wise people, they're always thinking, oh, what is this time for? You know, wise people think, oh, there's a right time to say this. There's a right time to make this decision. There's a right time to take that action. As the saying goes, timing is everything. See, wise people know what time it is. And see, no one in the Bible displayed that better than Jesus Christ. See, Jesus had this way of knowing what every moment of his life was going to be about. He had this way of knowing, in this present season, I know what I'm supposed to do. Look, for example, at John chapter 7, verse 6. See, nowadays when people want to get famous, what do they do? They go on social media. But see, back in Jesus' day, there was no social media. When people in Jesus' time and culture wanted to get famous, they would go to the Feast of Tabernacles. It was the biggest feast in the Jewish calendar. People would gather in the region of Judea. And so Jesus' brothers, who know that Jesus is starting a public ministry, they themselves don't believe in him quite yet, but they're like, you want Jesus? You want to be famous? Why don't you go to the feast right now. And Jesus, what does he say in response? In John chapter seven, verse six, he says, it says, Jesus told them the right time for me has not yet come. For you, any time is right. You go to the feast. I am not yet going up to this feast because for me, the right time has not yet come. If you have that in front of you, you can underline those words. The right time has not yet come. Here's another one. John chapter 13, verse one says, it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. See, what's going on here is that Jesus was responding and acting based on what time is it? On saying, okay, what is this time for? Is this the right time? I'm gonna go for it. Jesus had this acute understanding, this sensitivity. What time is it? Turn to him and say, what time is it? He was always thinking, what is this time for? Look at Romans 5 verse 6. What does it say? It says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. At just the right time. It's the idea that when we were separated from God because of our sins, when each one of us had done our own thing, not God's way, we did it our way. The Bible says our way separated us from God. When we did things that we regret, stuff that we know we shouldn't have done, and we made it our way instead of God's way, God says that our sins separate us from God, such that the wages of our sin is death. In other words, because of our sin, we can't have anything to do with God. Not now, not later, not here on earth, not in heaven. We can't have anything to do with God because sin separates us from God. But because God loves us, because he couldn't bear the thought of being in eternity without us, God did something about our predicament. He said, when we were separate from God, I'm gonna send my son, Jesus Christ, for you. Jesus died on the cross for our sins at just the right time. He died on the cross to pay for our sins so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be brought back to God, so that not based on what we do, but based on what Jesus Christ has done for us, we can be reconciled to God and have a relationship with God again and experience his peace, his hope, his purpose in our lives. If you believe that, give God a big hand this place together right now because that's God's unconditional love for you and for me. See, at just the right time, Jesus died for the ungodly. Jesus died for you and me. When we had no way of reaching God, God reached for us at just the right time. Everyone say the right time. 
See, Jesus was focused on what is this time for? That's what wise people do. In fact, look at Ecclesiastes chapter eight, verse five and six with me right now. What does it say? It says, the wise heart will know the proper time and procedure. For there is a proper time and procedure for every matter, though a man's misery weighs heavily upon him. It's this idea that wise people know what time it is. They know what this season that they're in is for, and they realize it and they do something about it. How about for you? When you're looking at the current season that you're in right now, how would you describe this season you're in? What is this time for? We're going to talk about that today. See, my question for all of you today is this. How do you know when it's time for a change? How do you know when God is leading you to something new, leading you to a new horizon? Let me put it to you this way. There are two ways that God can lead you to a new horizon, two ways. And the first way is this. The first way that God leads you to a new horizon is where you have no choice in the matter where it's not about your choice, it's all simply about God's sovereignty. It's about God either wanting to happen or allowing it to happen beyond your control. For example, years and years ago, my wife and I, uh, we were working toward having a baby. You know, it's, it's hard work, but it's also fun work, of course. And you know, it's one of those where we're working toward a baby, ho- hopefully having our first baby. And when we found out that Charlene was pregnant, that was a new horizon for us. It was a wonderful new horizon. If you believe that, say amen. And, and see, at that time, when we found out we we're pregnant, we didn't have any choice anymore, all right? We, we couldn't be like, oh, you know, could, oh do I want to be a dad or not? Should I be a dad? Should I say yes to being a dad? No, that wasn't a choice anymore. This horizon was here, and I just had to adjust to it. It was inevitable now. And see, one of the first things I did to get ready for this new horizon, which was now in many ways beyond my control, you know what I did? I went to uh, Metro Town Mall, and I went to Chapters Bookstore, and I got myself my first ever parenting book. It was Dads for Dummies. You know, the dummy series, you know, they've got like Microsoft Excel for dummies, Bitcoin training for dummies. I got How to Be a Great Dad for Dummies. That was the book that I got. And, and, you know, it was one of because I was trying to get ready for a brand new season and I had no idea the first thing about being a dad. And so I was like, I, I got to get ready for the season because no matter what, whether I like it or not, and the fact is I do like it, I want it, but I want to get ready for this new season. And praise God, nine months later, our eldest child was born and our world changed. And see, it's one of those things where that was a situation where God was leading us to a new horizon where we didn't have a whole lot of choice in the matter at one point. And see, that was a wonderful new horizon for us. But how many of you know that sometimes new horizons come beyond our control that you might not necessarily welcome? You know, maybe your family or your loved one moves to a new country and you have nothing, you have no choice in that matter. Or maybe, you know, a relationship that you cared about ended and you didn't choose for that to happen. Or maybe someone dear to you left or they even passed away and you didn't choose that. Or maybe you lost your job for reasons that are beyond your control. See, for reasons beyond your control, you're now experiencing this new horizon. And the question is now, okay, what do I do now? The new horizon is here. What do I do? It's not much choice in it. It's just, how do I adjust? And see, these are not necessarily things that God wanted to have happen in your life, but in a world that's broken by sin, in a world where we're free to make our own choices, God will allow certain things to happen that are beyond our control. And when they affect us in big ways, that is effectively God allowing a new horizon in your life. And then let me just tell you this right now. If you are going through something really tough right now that you feel is beyond your control, then let me tell you this. God God is for you. He's not against you. See, God is not allowing it to be cruel to you because he hates you. He's here to mess with your life. No, God loves you. We know that because he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for us. God is good. And he promises that in all things, he works for the good of those who love him. In all things, God is working. He's writing a greater story with your life. And so don't give up. Hang on to God. Turn your name and say, God is writing a greater story. God is writing a greater story. See, that's the first way that God leads us to a new horizon, where we have no choice in the matter. It's God's sovereignty. But there's a second way that God leads us to a new horizon, and that second way is this. This is where God leads you to a new horizon, and you have a choice whether to follow. It's where God presents you with a new horizon, and you need to choose, am I in or am I out? Am I going with God or am I going to stay back? And see, that's the second way. And let me tell you, this in many ways is almost even more important than, any, than the first way, is that there will be some of the most important horizons of your life where you need to choose whether or not to go with God. And if you don't choose or if you choose not to go with God, that new horizon is not going to come because it depends on you choosing to go with God. And if you don't choose, it's just not going to come. And that's where it gets difficult. Because how do you know if it's really God leading you? 
That's what we're talking about today. See, today I want to share with you three clues that God may be leading you to a new horizon. Three clues. And if you're here and you really want to find, oh God, are you leading me in this new direction? Is that job really for me? Is that direction for me? Then I think this is going to be helpful for you. But let me just give you a couple disclaimers, Borf, I give you these three clues, all right? A couple disclaimers, a couple caveats, a couple qualifiers. Qualifier number one is that today I'm going to give you three clues that God may be leading you to a new horizon. Now, these clues assume that you are open to God. These clues assume that you are open to God's leading. If you are not open to God, if you think, you know, I'm not even sure if there is a God, and even if there is a God, I'm not interested in following, then these clues will not be meaningful to you at all. And so this assumes that you are open to God. And you, unless you're here and you're, you're here to laugh, you're here to be a critic, then I believe this. I believe the fact that you are here and watching this service, listen to this message, it signals that you are in some way open to God. You are in some way open to God's leading in your life. And if that's you, then keep these three clues in mind because they're going to be helpful and important for you. Here's a second qualifier for you. Is that these three clues are helpful when you're making big decisions about your future that affect you and others. Do not use these three clues to help you make every single little decision in your life. Like say you're at small group or sorry, say you're you're at Subway, for example. And you're like, oh, should should I order the veggie or the ham? You don't need to look at these three clues to determine what you choose. Because the fact is, God gives us the freedom to choose. It's, not, it's, it's one where, you know, part of growing up, part of maturing spiritually is learning to make our own choices, learning to think through our choices, and learning to own those choices. They believe that say, amen. And so, you know, it's one of those things where you have certain decisions you make where God is saying, go ahead and choose. It's up to you. But there's certain big decisions in life where it really, really, really helps to seek God and say, God, what specifically are you leading me to? Things that affect you, things that affect others in a significant way. And if that's you and you're that kind of of situation right now, then pay attention to these three clues we're going to be talking about today. Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13 says it this way. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So much we can unpack from that passage, but what, we can, what, what can we learn? Number one, God has an amazing plan for your life. God has a plan to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. God's not here to mess with you. God's not here to ruin your life. God is here because he has a plan that's better than anything you and I could plan. But if you want to experience that plan, it says you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You need to be willing to seek him on it. You'd be willing to say, God, what is your plan? Don't just kind of be this automaton, just kind of go through life. Oh, if it happens, it happens. No, you want to actively seek him. Here's another one that talks about the same thing. Psalm 32, verse eight and nine. Read it with me. It says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. See, what is that teaching us? Is that God wants to lead you in the best way. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. But see, don't be like an animal that needs to be led by force before you come to God. Is that don't be an animal where you, know, you, can, you, you, you need to be forced to get to that new horizon. You, and, and that's not what God wants. Is that God wants you to be someone who will willingly come to God and say, what do you want for my life? and be open to it, and seek him on it. And so don't be like a horse or a mule which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Be someone who's gonna come to God and take the initiative to do so. With that in mind, here are three clues that God may be leading you to a new horizon, whether it's a new relationship, a new job, another big decision that affects you or others. Clue number one, you guys ready? Clue number one, write this down. You have a personal desire for that new horizon. You have a personal desire for that new horizon. No, wait, wait, JB. I I thought you were talking about how is God leading us to a new horizon. You're talking like now about my desire. What's that about? See, how come you're talking about my desire when we're talking about God's leading? Let me tell you this put it this this way. See, a lot of people they get stuck in this rut, this unhealthy way of thinking, where they think whatever God wants for my life is probably really different from what I want. And so, for example, maybe I want to get married. I want to, I want to marry someone who's young and pretty. Oh, maybe God, he wants me to marry someone who's old and ugly. Or, or maybe God doesn't want to be married at all. How can what I want be the same as what God wants? You know, or, or maybe you've always dreamed about setting up your own business. And you thought, you know, you know, in Vancouver, I want to set up my own business. But, oh, but maybe God doesn't want that for me. Maybe he wants to send me to some you know, you know, underdeveloped country to be you know, a, like a, a missionary there. And that, that's the stereotypical way that people sometimes think about God. God is that somehow, you know, whatever we want can't be what God wants. 
And that, you know, God, what he wants is always opposite from what we want. And see, that is an unhealthy way of thinking. And like we learned earlier in the series, that sometimes an unhealthy way of thinking can become a rut that becomes our default way of thinking about things. And you have to find out what is the lie at the root of the rut? What could be the lie at the root of this rut? Is that you might, the lie at that rut could be, you, know, you think God doesn't care about what I want or God can't work through what I want, or you know, what I want must be totally opposite and different from what God wants. And, tell you, and let me tell you this, that is a lie. See, especially when your heart is set on living for Jesus, especially when you have a relationship with God and you're working on that relationship with God, especially when you're set on honoring God with your life, how many know God actually works through your desires? Look at Philippians 2, 12 to 13 with me. What does it say? It says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Would you underline those words? It is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. What is, what is Paul saying? See, Paul, he's a church planter. He used to be the most anti-Christian guy around. He encounters Jesus in a powerful way. He becomes a missionary, a church planter, and he's speaking to, writing to one of the churches that he helped start in the city of Philippi. And he's saying, continue to work out your salvation. In other words, these people had received Jesus into their lives. They now have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That is called salvation. And he's saying, continue to work it out. In other words, like a muscle that God has given you, continue to work that muscle, continue to build that muscle, continue to you know, do those curls and develop that muscle so that you can be strong in your relationship with God. And he says, for verse 13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. In other words, as you work out your relationship with God, as you grow more like Jesus in your character, in your values, in your attitude, in your perspective, more and more, your heart is going to conform more and more to what God's heart is like. Slowly and surely, never perfectly, not until we get to heaven, but slowly and surely. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 in another translation. It says, it is God who produces in you the desires and actions that please him. And see, this can be one of the most underrated and misunderstood parts about seeking God's will for your life, is that when your heart is surrendered to God, when you are set on living for God and honoring God with your life, God will actually work through your desires and lead you through your desires. And so if you have a desire to get married, don't just assume, oh, that can't be God because that's me. Oh, that can't be God because, you know, that's just me thinking things. You know, it could very well be God putting that desire in you. Now, let me ask you this. Does that mean that every desire you ever have is a desire from God? No. No, just like, you know, when a new government comes into power, you know, at City Hall, the new mayor gets installed. Does that mean automatically that the rest of the city is now in conformance with his policies and plans and, and, and priorities? No, it takes time. And so you're going to realize that, you know, as you have Jesus in your life, you're also going to be struggling with sin from time to time. And you're also struggling with other things. And so you need to be careful. You need to see, okay, how do I know this is God's, work, God's desire working through me versus just my own desire? So we got to be careful. And so let's ask ourselves some of some questions. How do you know if the desire is from God or not? It's not an easy question to answer, but let me give you a few things you can ask yourself as you're trying to determine, is this just me or is this maybe God putting a desire in me? Here's a question you can ask yourself. Number one, is this a desire that the Bible encourages or discourages? See, God will never say to you, for example, cheat on your wife. Have that affair. Go ahead, do it do it. No, God will never say that because God will never contradict his word. And so you got to go back to the Bible and say, what does the Bible say about this desire that I have? Here's another one. By acting on this desire, would I become more like Jesus in my character, my attitude, my values, or less like Jesus? See, so for, for, for example, maybe you're thinking about changing jobs. You're like, is it time to change jobs? Maybe there's another job that you're thinking about, maybe a business that you want to start. And you got to ask yourself these questions. Is this desire, if I act on it, am I becoming more like Jesus in that direction or is it the opposite? Am I, for example, am I breaking any promises that I've made? you know, by doing that? Am I doing a job, going after a business that is maybe not pleasing to God? You know, what impression am I giving to people about Jesus or about me or about Christians generally by going in this direction? By acting on desire, how does that lead me to Jesus or away from Jesus? Here's another one. Is this desire consistent with the way that God has shaped me? 
Say you have a desire to be on a stage leading people in songs, in worship, you know, and, but, but what if, you know, God maybe didn't give you a voice that can keep a tune, you know? That could be something where you have a desire, but it's not necessarily consistent with your shape, and you kind of got to thinking, is that really a desire that God has given to you and to me? By the way, I believe every single one of us is talented. Every single one of us has been given amazing gifts, and you're, if you're kind of curious, like, what are those gifts? If you don't really know what, how God has gifted you, then you got to take a course called Thrive to Supple School Level 3. And we had our last term of that back in the summer, TDS level three, it's called embracing your God-given shape. Our next term is in January. Sign up for that if you're kind of wondering, like how did God shape me so that you can then you know, say, has this desire, is it consistent with the way that God has shaped me? Another question you ask yourself, is this desire consistent with God's purposes for my life? Last week we learned that God has five purposes for our lives. We're here to worship Jesus, to grow more like Jesus, to serve Jesus with our talents, to lead others to Jesus, and to love his spiritual family called his church. Does me following desire move me in the direction of God's purposes for my life, or is it something else? Another one, why do I desire this? In other words, you want to check your motives. Is, it, is this something that is for me and my glory or is it for God and God's glory? See, these are different questions you can ask yourself when you're trying to check, is this desire that I have something that God is working in me or is it just me? See, these are different things you can ask yourself. And if you find at the end of asking yourself these questions that you realize, actually, you know what? Maybe this desire isn't God's best for me. You can then say, just like Jesus did at one point, not my will, but yours be done. But see, when you have a desire that is from God, that where God has put that desire in you, then the thing that God doesn't want you to do is to let go of that desire, deny that desire, forget about that desire, run away from that desire. He wants you to do something with that desire. You know, I kind of hesitate to share these kind of stories with you guys because I don't want to make you make me feel like I'm boasting because I'm not. Because the fact is, every single person has their own calling, uh, and uh, the fact is that this is my story. Is that when I was in first year university. I was thinking about my future, and I thought that one direction I would love to go in vocationally or professionally or career-wise or calling was, was that you know, I, I thought you know, I, I would love to be a pastor one day, and I thought to myself that that would be a really good fit for me, the way that I'm wired, you know, and I, just, I was really excited about that idea. For me, there was nothing more beautiful than the church when it's operating the way it's meant to operate, that, that there's nothing more beautiful, nothing more powerful, nothing that is more hope-giving and life-bringing than when you've got a church that is running on all cylinders, the way that God meant for churches to run. And for me, I'm passionate about that. That for me is like one of the ways that God wired me. And so I thought to myself, you know, I love to be a pastor one day. I'd love to be part of building churches one day. And see, you know, I, I, I had that in my heart back in like first year New Year's. I'm like 18, 19 years old. And I, I went up to my pastor at that time and I, we had a sit down meeting together. And I said, hey, you know, I, I feel like maybe God is maybe calling me to be a pastor. And you know what his response was? Well, he opened up his Bible and he took me to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. And it says this, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says, whoever aspires to be an overseer, which is kind of like a pastor, desires a noble task. And that's basically all he said. And, and I was like, okay. And I was kind of too afraid to ask him, but I was like, does that mean that this is something I should pursue or not? And he didn't really say anything. And I wasn't really sure what that meant. It's like, are you encouraging me? Or are you discouraging? Are you saying that you desire something that's not for you? Or you desire something that you're not, you know, you're, you're not qualified for? I wasn't really sure. And looking back now, looking back now, many, many years, I know that that was God working in my life. But at that time, I wasn't sure. But it was a desire that started from a long time ago. Remember this. Remember that your heart is the wellspring of life, the Bible says. That out of your heart, everything flows. And so when God is leading you, he will often lead you from your heart through your will because if he doesn't how else is he going to lead you that's the first clue that God is leading to a new horizon you have a personal desire for that new horizon that's the first clue are you guys ready for the second clue clue number two write this down you have a specific sense of God guiding you to that new horizon you have a specific sense of God guiding you to that new horizon. In other words, you sense that there is more to this desire than just you wanting it. That maybe, just possibly, this is God in different ways pointing you in a direction that God wants you to go in. And maybe, just maybe, suggesting that now is the time to do something about it. Look at Acts 16, verse 6 to 10 right now. We're going to read this passage. There's a bunch of different words of different towns, names of different towns, but follow me on it. Verse 6, it says, Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatea, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus 
Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave from Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So here's Paul once again, and he's got his crew, his team, and they're you know, church planting, they're you know, preaching the gospel to different places. They want to go to different nations and trying to think, figure out where, where are they supposed to go next? And you know, they don't have a lot of peace about going to some of the places like, some places like Bithynia. They're like, you know, the spirit of Jesus would not let us go there. But then at night, Paul has this vision of a man who's begging them to come to Macedonia. And, and during this time where he's, we don't know if it was a dream or if it was him you know, sensing it in prayer, but Paul, he has this vision. And at the end of that, they realize that they, they, they conclude that this was God's way of specifically guiding them to Macedonia. And that's what they do. And see, Paul, that happened to him. How do you know that God is able to guide you as well? And there are different ways that God will use to guide you in different directions that he wants you to go in. The Bible describes many different ways that God can speak. He can guide you through scripture. He can guide you through a prophetic word that is consistent with scripture. He can guide you through a dream. He can guide you through a vision that you have in prayer. He can guide you through, through some highly unusual circumstances. He can guide you through a word spoken to your heart that's consistent with scripture. You know, I remember when it came to my desire to be a pastor, when I was 19 years old, from that time forward, there would be different moments in my life where I felt like God was maybe specifically guiding me to that new horizon. Let me just share one of them with you. And that is this, you know, after that conversation with my pastor when I was 19 years old, I didn't really know what to do with that conversation. So I didn't really take any formal steps to do anything about becoming a pastor one day. I just thought, you know, maybe it's just not time. I'll just kind of leave it. And I just served at church, did my best with that. I applied to law school, got into law school, became a lawyer, which I thought was a God thing as well, because I wouldn't have let myself into law school. But it was just one of those things where God did that. And, and, you know, seven years after that conversation with that pastor, Charlene and I were in a conference in Korea. And uh, we're praying, we're spending some time like fasting, drawing near to God, talking and, and just kind of just like, and, and we didn't have anything about our future in mind. We weren't, we weren't praying about our future. We weren't doing any of that. We're just worshiping God, drawing near to God. And in that time, this very intense time of worship and prayer, I see this picture that I did not expect to see at that moment. And the picture I saw was of me kneeling on a stage and these different pastors from different stages of my life as I'd grown up were, were kind of surrounding me and putting their hand on my head and praying for me. And I knew what that picture represented. I knew that that picture was a picture of ordination, a picture of someone praying or a group of pastors who are kind of commissioning, ordaining someone to become a pastor. And when I saw it, I just started to cry because I wasn't expecting that picture, but it was a picture that was so kind of like just kind of tattooed on my brain that I couldn't let it go. And later that day, I, I told my pastor in Taiwan about this. And he was very, very encouraging. He prayed for me. I remember he didn't have the best English, but he put his hand around, but he put his arm around me and he said, JB, to be a pastor. And, and he said, praying for me. And, and that, 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 that's all he said in English. That's all I understood. But that, 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 that's the thing. Is that he prayed for me and he encouraged me. And he, and he started to give me opportunities to train in things that I guess pastors would do. And up to that point, I'd never taken any formal steps to train in the direction of becoming a pastor after seven years of thinking about it. And it was one of those things where I, feel, I felt like at that point, God was starting to specifically guide me in that direction say, the time is now to start getting ready. And so, you know, like a few months later, I enrolled in seminary, which is one of those schools that you go to, to train to be a pastor. And, you know, it was one of those things where finally I was starting to take a step in a new horizon. And see, nine years after I saw that picture, nine years, that was like July 2004, nine years later, and I think April 2013, I'm you know, sitting in church and we're, we're having, uh, that, that, it's kind of funny that that moment that I saw, that, that, that picture, that vision I saw of these different pastors from my life praying for me, that actually happened. Is I'm, I'm kneeling and I didn't expect it, but different, literally different, different pastors from different like, times of my life, they came together and they prayed for me on that day. And it was one of those things where it was like, man, God, I believe you have a new horizon for me. And see, does that mean that anytime God leads you to a new horizon, it all, all, always has to come with a big sign? You know, a sign in the sky, a bolt of lightning, you know, electricity, you know, some big dream, some huge vision, some crazy circumstances. No, not necessarily. In fact, I find that more often than not, when, when the Holy Spirit speaks to me, it's not through big, huge, loud signs, but very often it's through a still, small voice in my heart. 
And you know, there have been times when you know, I've, I've sensed God say, fight for this property. Or I'll sense God say, if you propose to her, I will definitely bless you. And, and those, those just little things where I just a still small voice that, 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 are, that, that, that are so small that no one else hears it, but it's, but it's God's way of guiding me. And see, whatever way God used to speak to you, whether it's a vision, a word, a dream, a scripture verse, one thing will usually accompany a message of God's guidance, which is peace that passes understanding. If you're kind of wondering, is it God or is it not? You know, you want to ask yourself, like, what kind of peace do you sense as you receive that message? Look at John 14, 26 and 27. It says, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So you notice that right after Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to send the Holy Spirit to teach them and to guide them, what does he say next? He talks about peace. He says, peace, I leave you. What does that teach you? Is that God's guidance and God's peace go hand in hand. Is that God's guidance and God's peace go hand in hand. When you pray about it, you sense God's peace. When you, when you, when you talk about it and you think about it in that direction, and it's just not a single moment, but each time you do, you sense God's peace. It says God leads us with his peace. He's a God of peace. If you believe that, say Amen. Amen. That's the second clue that we're talking about is that you sense a specific way that God is guiding you in that new direction. Clue number three. Clue number three that God is leading to a new horizon. Other followers of Jesus whom you trust and respect affirm your pursuit of that new horizon. In other words, when you ask others for advice, specifically other followers of Jesus whom you trust and respect, what is their feedback? Is their feedback positive and encouraging and affirming? Or is their feedback like, oh no, I don't think that is. Or I would be hesitant with, oh, I'd I pray more about that. See, but what, which, which kind of feedback are you receiving when you ask others whom you trust and respect who are also following Jesus? Because here's the thing, you can desire a new horizon all you want. You can believe, oh God is speaking to me. But if you don't check it with others, you could be going off on the wrong track. Why is that important? It's because sensing God's leading was never meant to be something you just do on your own. As a follower of Jesus, you are part of a much bigger team, a much bigger family, a much bigger body. It's called God's people, his church. And there's a reason why the Bible describes God's people as the body of Christ. It's like a body with Christ at the head. See, just as a hand is dead and useless when it is disconnected from the rest of the body, so your ability and my ability to sense what God is doing and where God is going and how God is leading depends on how well connected you are to the body. It depends on how well connected you are to others and how you, well you work with others. Otherwise, you could find yourself living in your own world. And see, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 20 says it this way, as it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Turn to him and say, I actually need you. I actually need you. See, God put you in the body of Christ for a reason. It's so that you are able together with others to discern what God wants for you. Because how many know that God's plan for your life is not just about you. It's not just about your happiness, your comfort, your dreams. All that. It's not about you. It's about something much, much bigger than you. It's called the kingdom of God. And see, don't cut yourself off from the bigger body of Christ when you're making big decisions about your future. Don't quarantine your decision making and say, oh, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna sense God on my own. I'm going to you know, think about what I, I'm going to look deep inside, but you're not going to talk to anyone about it. You're not going to ask for prayer. You're not going to ask for advice. Since you're part of the body of Christ, use it. Go to other Christians and say, hey, like it's people you trust, people you respect and go, what do you think? Am I missing something here? Like, is, am I going the right direction? Is there anything that like any blind spots that I don't see here? Could you pray for me? Proverbs 20 verse 18 says it this way. Make plans by seeking advice. If you wage war, obtain guidance. I remember I was in the middle of second year and third year law school. Law school is three years. Between second year and third year law school in the summer, I was you know, on this missions trip. And during that time, I was praying. And, and there was a moment when I was in praying when I kind of thought I sensed God saying, leave law school and go be a pastor right away. 
I thought maybe, just maybe that was God. And I wasn't really sure. And, 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 you know, and you know, I think there's a part of me that, if I look at my desires, clue number one, did I want that? I think there's a part of me that really wanted that. It was, it's kind of romantic, kind of dramatic. Sounds like a movie. You know, it's, it's just one of those you know, typical Hollywood, he left that for this. But, but, but that, I, I knew that was that. I thought clue number two, well, maybe that is God speaking to me. I wasn't sure. I wasn't absolutely positive about it. I'm not sure how much peace I had about it, but I was just like, well, maybe. I, I'm what, 22 years old at that point, 21 years old. And, and, and you know, but when it came to clue number three, whenever I check this thought, this sense, this direction with the people in my life that I respected and trusted, you know what they would say? Almost every single one of them would say the same thing. They say, we believe that this is just a matter of time, but not now. Don't go and move into that now. Finish what you started. Because what, I'm, what, what you have right now, you know, this law degree and all that stuff, this is going to help you down the road. This is going to be an asset, not a liability for you. So use what God has given you. Finish what you started. And so instead of that really romantic, da 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 da, away with the law stuff, into, instead of that, it was something else. It was use what God has given you. Use all of it. And, and that was like invariably the advice I was getting from people. And so, you know, even as much as I wanted, I just could, kind of couldn't get by, couldn't get past the idea that all these people who are advising me, people that I love, respect, and trust are saying, you know, hang on, don't, don't rush just yet. God has his own timing. And see, I'm so glad for that advice because I could have made a mistake if I didn't do that. You know, I remember I was, another time I wanted to change jobs. I was working at a law firm and I really didn't like the amount of money I was making and I really wanted to change jobs. I thought maybe I'll start a, an English teaching business in Taiwan, maybe I'll do that. But then, you know, I, I didn't get any sense from God that that was it and I didn't get any sense from anyone else that, you know, that's what I should do and so I left it. I'm so glad I did because that would have been a mistake. See, here's the thing. If you're not sure what to do about the sense you have or the desire you have, go and ask people you love and trust and respect about it because that's what the body of Christ is for. And if you're not sure where to start on that, join a small group. Go to mythrob.info, press small group and join one because we would love to be having a community. We'd love for you to be part of that community. See, these are three clues that God may be leading you. Now, does that mean that as long as you have these three clues, then you can never go wrong? No. You can actually still go wrong, even if you believe that you have these three clues in place. That's because we're human. And that's because, you know, we can sometimes misread and other people can misread as well. But here's the thing. Even when all three clues are present, that's what you, there, there's still a chance that, you know, you can be wrong, but you got to remember this. That's where faith comes into play. That's why faith is so important. Because no matter how much you analyze it, no matter how much you pray about it, no matter how much you seek advice, no matter how much you do all those things to try to confirm that this is the right way, this is the thing, there will always be a point where you need to exercise some faith to move forward. And there will never be a point where there's no gap, where you don't need to think about it anymore. You don't have to have any faith. You just kind of, oh, it's a no-brainer. I'll just do it right now. No, it's, it's one of those where you always need to exercise faith, and that is intentional. Because look, look at Hebrews 11, verse 6. It says this. It says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Let me put it to you this way. God doesn't want you to live by a formula. He wants you to live by faith. God wants you not to live by formula, but by faith. We live by faith and not by sight. It's about learning to live by faith and say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust in you. God, it's not a formula that I trust in, but it's you that I trust in. And the good news is this, is that even if you make a mistake, if your heart was surrendered to God, if your heart was set on honoring God, if your heart is set on, you know, no matter what, I want to do what you want me to do, then guess what? Even if you make the wrong move, even if you make the mistake, God will use that decision in some way for good. And he will honor the faith with which you move forward. If you believe that, say amen because that is how good and sovereign God is. And so be wise and be careful when you think through decisions, but don't be afraid to move in faith because every move God wants you to make will always require faith. And because without faith, it is impossible to please God. He's here because he wants a relationship with you. Not so you just have a formula where you can kind of figure things out on your own. You have an app, you know, how to figure out God's will app, you know, and, and just kind of put in your variables and, oh, I got a formula, I'm good. No, that's not what God wants. He wants a relationship with you. He wants you to trust him, to walk with him, to sense his leading, to hear his voice, to know his heart and become more like him in the process. And see, if you're here today and you're kind of new to all of this, and you're kind of like, you know, I want a relationship with God where I can sense his presence in my life, where I can even maybe hear his voice and sense his leading and, 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 and just have that, have a, a peace that I can't get on my own. 
then I want to encourage you to do one thing with me right now. Is that earlier today we began by saying that God's love for you is unconditional. And God showed us that love when he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for your sins. And if you're new to church and you're kind of wondering, what is my next step? Can I tell you? Your next step is to ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins. Your next step is to open up your heart and say, Jesus, come into my life. I need you. I'm a sinner who needs a savior. And I thank you for dying on the cross for me. And if that's you, then I encourage you to take this very simple step, which is as simple as praying a prayer. It's not so much the words you speak as the attitude of your heart, but if you realize today that you want a relationship with God and you want forgiveness for your sins, and you realize that you can't earn that forgiveness just by being really good because God is perfect, we're not, but God sent Jesus long before we ever knew at just the right time so that we could have that forgiveness. If you want to receive that forgiveness, why don't you click the link that's in your chat room right now? Why don't you scan that code that's uh, on your screen? It's going to take you to a prayer that you can pray to invite Jesus Christ to forgive your sins, to invite Jesus Christ into your life. If that's you, we'd love to pray this prayer with you just so that you know you're not doing this on your own. Wherever you're watching and worshiping in the service right now, you're not alone. And we'd love to pray this prayer with you right now. And this is a simple way for us to ask Jesus Christ into our lives to forgive us for our sins. And so that's you. Click that link, scan that code. And we're just going to pray this together with all those who are praying for the first time. Uh, Church, why don't you support those who are praying for the first time right now by praying this with me right now. Say, dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. That because you love me. That because you love me. You died on the cross. You died on the cross. To pay for my sins. For my sins. You rose again. You rose again. To give me life. To give me life. Today. I open up my heart heart. and I ask you, you, please forgive me me of all my sins sins. and please fill me me with your Holy Spirit. Spirit. I place my trust trust. not in what I do, do. but in what you've done for me. me. In Jesus' name I pray. pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer and you meant that prayer, then according to the Bible, you are forgiven of your sins. You have a brand new relationship with God, not based on what you do, but based on what Jesus Christ has done for you. You are a child of God. You're a citizen of heaven. And we believe the best is yet to come. In fact, can we give a big congratulations to all those who prayed that prayer just now? Praise God. Oh, there's more than that at church. Come on, give God all of your encouragement right now. And uh, if that was you, you prayed that prayer just now, we want to encourage you a couple ways. Encourage you to keep coming to church. Every baby needs a family to grow up in. We'd love to be your spiritual family. On top of that, we encourage you to get baptized. Baptism is not a graduation. Baptism is a beginning. And it's you simply saying, I know I'm a sinner who needs a savior. Thank Jesus for dying on the cross for me. You can go to mythrive.info, press the baptism button for more information on baptism. We'd love to help you with that. Finally, for those of you who did receive Jesus Christ just now, prayed that prayer, go to the bottom of your prayer page and there will be a gift there, especially for you, just to congratulate you and encourage you in this new relationship with God. Praise God. What an amazing Sunday we've had here together at Thrive. That brings our new heart, new horizon series to a close. Everyone say, aw. Aw. Um, but if you've enjoyed the series, if you have been encouraged and blessed by the series, I encourage you to rate and review it. Go to Google, tell other people about it, because in so doing, we're living out loud. We're leading others to Jesus. I'm going to pray with you in just a second, but I want to ask the team right now to lead us in this song. Since Jesus Christ lived for us, let's live for Jesus. And let's do this together right now. Let's give our very best to God, because he gave his very best to us.